everybody. Um, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. Um, I would like to introduce myself first. Um, I'm the technical account manager of Sinobiological Company, and it's my pleasure to um, officially welcome everybody online to uh, now to the next installment in our series on COVID-19 cutting edge immunodiagnosis. Uh, so welcome everyone. Um, a few housekeeping items. I want to mention that um, everyone here will be muted throughout the webinar, but you can ask questions in a chat box at the bottom of the screen. So I highly recommend you to type in your questions in the chat box. At the end of the seminar, I will select questions from the chat box and ask our uh, speakers today to answer these questions. In addition to uh, that, I want to mention that this webinar today is being recorded. Everyone who registered um, and attending today will get a link to the recorded webinar. So without further ado, it's my uh, pleasure and honor to introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Mingjie Tang and Dr. Uh, Hong Jie Dai. Um, Dr. Hong Jie Dai is um, the G.G. Jackson and C.G. Wood Professor of Chemistry at Stanford, Stanford University. Dr. Dai has made pioneer contribution to the nanosciences. His group has been uh, working at interface between chemistry, physics, material science, electric engineering, and medicine through uh, nanosciences and novel materials. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Medicine, and fellow of the uh, of American uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has received the APS James um, McBrody Prize for new materials, the ACS Pure Chemistry Award, the MRS Mid-Career Research, Research Award, and the NIH Pioneer Award. He is a co-founder um, consultant and scientific advisor to Nomida's bio, Biotech, a company in Palo Alto commercializing novel IVD product and NIR2 fluorescence imaging product. Dr. Ming Jia Tao is a co founder and CEO of Nomida's Biotech. She holds a PhD from MIT and have been a material scientist and project manager at Lawrence Livermore National Lab for nearly two decades. Since co-founding the Midas in 20, uh, 2013, Dr. Town has led the startup to develop and launch new technology platforms and, um, uh, and products based on nearly infrared fluorescence technology for diagnostic and imaging. The company's key technology platform is aiming to amplify signal to noise ratio to enhancing fluorescent signals using nanoplasmonic gold microarray slides. Nomadis has developed P gold assay platform for research use and for clinical lab use. Applications including assays for type one diabetes Zika and dengue uh, vi virus infection, and the recent COVID-19 infections. So Dr. Tao and Dr. Dai, it's a pleasure to have you today. We appreciate your time. And now I'll officially turn to the, the screen over to you, Dr. Tan. Thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Meiji Tan. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Nomida Biotech. Um, today, we would like to uh, give a presentation about our company's uh, COVID diagnostic products development and uh, uh, research and the clinical product introduction. Uh, I will give a very brief overview about the multiple developments that's going on in the company. Then I will give most of the time to Dr. Dai, who's the scientific consultant and advisor to the company to uh, give a more in-depth discussion of the high performance 
multiplex the SARS-2 mm -hmm. antibody assay with avidity and saliva capability on the nanoplasmonic platform. If you look at the background in my picture, that's a nanoplasmonic gold coated micro slides. It's a snapshot of the manufacturing process for the, uh, the P gold assay. Uh, so the company uh, is, was originally a Stanford University spin-off. Uh, we are about six to seven years old. Our mission is to develop uh, next generation fluorescence uh, technology for both in vitro diagnostics and in vivo imaging for research and uh, clinical applications. Uh, over the past years, we have built a team uh, for antibody and antigen test development that include R&D, manufacturing, quality assurance, and the regulatory. We have uh, a, both a chemical and a bio lab, has a GMP facility for IVD, and is building a quality system. We are registered with FDA and the CDPH licensed as a medical device company. Uh, here shows the company's the three core platforms. Uh, the first one is the Pico multiplex assay, uh, which has already been, already been used in clinical lab to launch LDT clinical tests. Uh, today, Dr. Dai will give more uh, discussion about how this platform is used for the COVID uh, antibody tests. The second one is a point of care infrared based uh, uh, diagnostic system. And we are currently using this to develop a quantitative antigen test for the COVID. Third one is an invisible imaging system that will not be discussed here today. Um, since the COVID pandemic broke, uh, Nomadios has uh, engaged in development of multiple uh, products to uh, detect the COVID-19 infection. The first one is a rapid test IgG IgM. It's a lateral flow based. Uh, we have launched uh, as an IVD for high complexity lab use currently. We are seeking FDA approval to launch a POC uh, use for POC use, eventually go to home use, hopefully. Um, the second one is the high performance uh, uh, P gold assay that you will hear uh, in depth led by discussion led by Dr. Dai today. I would like to say uh, a few words about the rapid test, the first antibody test that we launched. Um, on the left, we summarize the performance of this test um, for based on 86 PCR positive clinical lab samples. The IgG performance is 100% uh, for uh, symptom onset day 14 and after. And in the IgM performance is a 90% for post day eight of symptom onset. And for specificity, Based on 424 pre-COVID samples, the IgG performance is 99%, the IgM is 97%, the combined is a 98%. The combined is defined by both IgG and IgM being negative. Uh, this rapid test has been launched for IVD already under FDA notification currently waiting for uh, FDA's final EUA authorization. The tests have been used in over 10 states uh, in US. If you're interested, contact us. Um, on the right, it shows a prospective study of several conversion. Uh, being a qualitative rabbit test, uh, it is, however, capable of uh, detecting the serial conversion for infected patients. This is a study done in the Southern California clinical lab with a 
patients in the local hospital for about 40 patients, uh, prospectively detecting the antibodies at the different days post the PCR positive test. Uh, as you can see here, uh, we observed the antibody response from uh, has no antibody, the light orange color box here, to IgM only, the light gray, and to IgM and IgG, the dark blue boxes here, eventually to IgG only, uh, this complete serial conversion. You can see a few examples here, green, green, and green. That's uh, with the IgG antibody only. Again, post 14 days after symptom onset, the antibody response is 100%. Now, um, our latest development is uh, to detect, develop a COVID-19 quantitative antigen POC test. This is based on our IR flow platform. The IR flow platform uses a NIR for excitation, the near infrared, and they use infrared for emission detection. It has a very large stokes shift, therefore give a very low background and a high signal to noise ratio. It's capable of both quantitative and qualitative assay. We are developing quantitative antigen for the COVID. It can read results in 10 to 15 minutes and it's a portable and a small to be used at all kinds of POC settings. So we have finished the proof of concept development. Currently we're conducting clinical sample testing. We seek collaborations who have access to samples to work with us to uh, co-publish papers and eventually to bring the test for FDA EUA authorization and for wider use, uh, surveillance and aid to diagnosis to fight the pandemic. Uh, with this brief overview, I will pass this talk to Dr. Dai. Okay, can you hear me okay? All right, so yes. I'll, I'll give uh, a, a talk on uh, antibody test on the PGOAT platform. And uh, before I start, I want to make sure I give credit to the, to the team members. Uh, as you can see here, I'm just working on this project as a consultant. Uh, it's uh, completely independent from Stanford. Um, so the people who really did the work are listed here. So these are the, the people from the Midas. <clears throat> and then these are the people uh, uh, Carl Hansen is, uh, is from the California Department of Public Health. <clears throat> and then and you see the, the team of uh, Jose Montoya, who is from um, uh, Palo Alto Medical Foundation <clears throat> or Sutter Health. Okay, and, and these are the, the team members from uh, Sutter Health. <clears throat> and the work I'm about to talk about is uh, mostly pu uh, published online, uh, but right now it's being reviewed in uh, Nature by medical engineering, and we're in the process of uh, revising the paper, and we're adding new data into the paper that we'll cover as well. So just a quick introduction to the plasmonic uh, GOAT platform for biologic assay. I mean, this really is a, a product of uh, nanoscience from uh, Stanford, and it's licensed to the Midas. Uh, what we have is, is a gold film here with these nano islands. Okay, so you see a lot of uh, gold nanoparticles, the irregular shape, the, the size of this is about 100 nanometer. So these individual islands are actually uh, has a plasmonic fre frequency around 700 to, to 900 to 1000. So it's in the near IR range. So you, you can excite plasmons in these gold films and then between each island you have these very small tiny nano gaps, right? The, the gaps are about 10 nanometer or so. So from physics we know there is this enhanced electric field between the you know, small gaps uh, of metal. Uh, 
furthermore, with the coupling to the to the plasma in the in the gold films, uh, uh, you you get this enhanced uh, 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 fluorescence, okay, which has been studied for for decades. Uh, so, so essentially, I, I don't have time to get into the details, but essentially, it's, it's a it's a film capable of enhancing near IR fluorescence by uh, about fifty to hundred times. Okay, so now imagine you do a, a biological assay uh, uh, using this platform. So, what you do here is you you print an uh, antigen on the on the substrate, right? And then you capture antibody in, in a serum or saliva, and then you attach a anti-human IgG or IgM with a fluorophore. Uh, okay, so it could be IR 800 dye, it could be a Psi 5 kind of dye, it can even be a very long wavelength dye uh, if, you, if you have access. Uh, essentially what you do is you, you boost the, the signal, uh, the fluorescent signal of this dye, right? And then through chemistry on the surface, you can minimize the non-specific binding, minimize the background, and therefore you're, you're able to enhance the signal to background, and therefore you get pretty high uh, uh, analytical uh, sensitivity, meaning you can detect very low concentrations of, of molecules. And, and this was an example done you know, many years ago uh, it's an antigen test uh, for for cancer uh, biomarker CEA. So in this case, you use a pair of antibodies to 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 capture and detect the antigen. And you can see this data here. We can detect the antigen over several logs of uh, of concentration, and the signal goes several orders of magnitude change. And you can detect it down to phantom of uh, of antigen. So this is what we're doing now for COVID nineteen antigen, and uh, I think we're going to have very high sensitivity uh, and detect a, a few viruses in in clinical samples. Uh, that's that's a goal we're targeting right now. But just quickly, it's, it's a multiplex because you can use a microarray technology, so you can measure cytokines in a multiplex manner. And this has been shown with collaborators and you can t detect autoantibodies in type one diabetes samples. So, so this was a, a, a detection of uh, anti-insulin, anti-GAD, anti-A2 antibodies in, in, in human samples uh, to, to diagnose type one di diabetes. And, it only needs uh, like a microliter of uh, serum or whole blood, okay? So you can see for type one diabetes, you see signals of these autoantibodies, but you don't see it in type two, right? So those are control spots. Um, this was one of the applications that the Midas is pursuing, again, as a spin-off from uh, Stanford. Uh, you can measure uh, multiple antibody subtypes as uh, IgG, IgM, IgA, just simply by using different fluorophores. Right? So you can uh, 800, Psi 5, Psi 3, and then you can measure IgG, IgM, IgA. So using one single drop of serum or blood, you can measure anti-human, you know, antibody against uh, 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 in IgG, IgM, or uh, IgA against uh, pretty much any infection. So, so here's a, 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 another example we, we, I want to show you briefly working with uh, Jose's lab in Palo Alto Medical Foundation, Sutter Health. So this was a work we did to really show you can detect uh, multiple diseases related to uh, pregnancy actually in serum, whole blood, and saliva. Okay. So this was the, in collaboration with Jose and, and a group in France, Christelle, uh, in France, uh, where you have a lot of those uh, uh, infections. So just want to quickly show you, you can use this uh, P-GOAT to detect antibodies uh, against the toxoplasmosis in serum, blood, and saliva. So I just want you to sh look at this pattern here. So basically, these are the positive ones, the red ones and these are the negative, you can see the consistency between saliva and serum is, is very good. You know, these are positive and these are negative and positive and, and negative. 
okay? Uh, so you can do this not only for talk, so you can do it for CNV, positive, positive, negative, negative, CNV, rubella. So, so the point is that PGOD is a platform capable of detecting antibodies in, in saliva, not only one type of, for not one, one type of disease, actually it can be used for multiple types of uh, diseases. The last example I want to show you is an essay we developed with Jeff Glenn's group at Stanford, and this was a, a hepatitis D virus infection. And uh, he told us, you know, this essay is uh, is a hundred percent sensitive and spe specific, uh, based on his studies of the of the clinical sample. So, so he, his group is very happy with this essay, and he thinks it has a lot of potential for clinic use. Lastly, we've done some work on the uh, flabby virus infection as well, uh, using this, uh, this uh, PGOAT platform, which uh, led us to the work of COVID-19 when it broke uh, you know, a few months ago. A lot of people are working on antibody tests for COVID-19, and, and I think uh, these are probably the reasons we want to develop assays for, for COVID. Uh, one is uh, we do want a very good sensitivity and specificity. You know, you want to have very few false positives, especially, right? Because if you do surveillance, for example, prevalence studies, you don't want to have any false positives. So it can help to aid diagnosis. It would not replace PCR, but it will help. Right? If it's out of the window of the PCR, then you can still say, oh, this person actually has had an a infection before. Um, antibody testing are always important for immunity assessment. You know, what is the level of antibody you need for immunity? It helps vaccine development. In fact, uh, you know, we actually worked with a big a few months ago in recruiting people for vaccine uh, development. And beyond that, it's actually very fundamental. It helps to understand the disease, okay? It helps to understand cross-reactivity and, and how it's related to previous uh, infections. Uh, I will show you a, a few examples today. Uh, first of all, I want to show you it's, uh, it's sensitive on the PGOD if you do dilutions of uh, patient serum. You know, this is a, a lot of dilution, more than a million dilution. You can still see signal pretty well. This is a log scale of the signal for IgG, and this is a log scale signal for, uh, for IgM, okay, over several magnitude, orders of magnitude of concentration. So we, we use two antigens. One is the spike protein S, S1 subunit, the other one is RBD as antigens. So these two curves are for different antigens and they work pretty well. So these are images of the, the raw data basically showing how you dilute the sample and you still see pretty good signals, you know, after a million fold dilution uh, on the platform. So, so this is uh, the data in the paper, which, uh, which is a two plex assay. So it's essentially detecting IgG, IgM by two dyes. One is the IR dye, the other one is the red dye, okay? So the, the, the IR dye here is represented here by the green spot. So this, this green row is, is, uh, is antibody in a patient binding to the S1 uh, antigen, okay? And, uh, and then you can notice this, this one actually had no binding to the RBD. I will talk about this patient uh, uh, quite a bit later on, but you know, pay attention to that. So, so this is a uh, this row is S1. This is RBD. So this is a COVID patient, COVID patient, and then you see this is negative. There's nothing there, right? So, so by detecting the this signal, you get IgG, and, and detecting the red, which is here. You see the red here. So this, this patient had no IgG, only the IgM. That's why you only have the, the red signal. So by doing this imaging, essentially, you can get a, a, a analysis of the IgG and IgM. 
in a patient sample very quickly against the two antigens. So, so here's uh, some data uh, from uh, uh, 60 or 70 uh, uh, COVID patients. Um, so, so this is in agreement with a lot of reports nowadays. Uh, you, you see that in the early days, you mostly see IgM, IgG level, you know, it's relatively rare or low. And over time, you get both IgG and IgM. Okay, so this is a 100% positive in IgG and IgM. Uh, so if you look at the sensitivity of the test, it's 100% if it's longer than 14 days. If it's longer, longer than 10 days, you get about 87% in the G, 93% in the M. But then if it's not that, you know, uh, long ago uh, onset, the antibody detection goes down, which makes sense. Now, specificity-wise, we measured a lot of samples, of 450 some samples, uh, and there are a few groups here. So this is the PCR positive COVID samples. Uh, this group is actually pre-pandemic samples. So these those are actually samples from 2017 or so a lot of those uh, are pre-pandemic samples. And then these are PCR confirmed the negative samples. And these are some uh, patients uh, with other diseases, okay? So you can see this assay is actually quite specific. So only the uh, COVID group shows very high signal in the antibody. So out of all, all the samples we got, which is this one. Okay, so so that gives us a very high specificity, ninety-nine point eight. Uh, there's very um, again. This is a summary of all the samples. Uh, you can see there's only one false positive, and that that's the uh, uh, specificity. And we did not see a lot uh, any actually cross activity with other diseases. So these are the common coronavirus common codes flu, autoimmune disease, HBV, HCV, Zika, dengue, uh, pneumonia, 70 samples, we really did not see any false positive signal suggesting it's very uh, uh, specific even to common codes. <clears throat> now with this platform, you can study more Okay, so one example is you can, you can try to correlate the antibody against S1 versus RBD, okay? And for the most part, you see the correlation is pretty good for IgG. This slope here is, is one. I mean, it's, it's pretty near the slope of one. You have ups and downs, except for this one sample. Okay, so this sample, I will talk a lot about the PAM65. It's positive in S1 antibody, but not to RBD. Okay, it's, it's sitting here. The RBD level is, is near zero. It's very uh, uh, interesting. Now for the IgM, you see, it actually goes away from that slope of one, so it's go, it goes, uh, 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 downward. So what that means is, is that the, the IgM shows higher affinity towards RBD than S1. And when you think about it, it kind of makes sense as well because RBD is the what's responsible uh, uh, on, the, on the virus uh, uh, spike that binds to the ACE2 receptor on a cell to start uh, uh, infection. Okay, so it looks like when the, the, pers the people infected are responding, the IgM is actually targeting that. It's targeting the, the RBD. <clears throat> so that's really uh, good to see. Uh, <clears throat> so, so now let's talk about what else we can do on this platform. We can easily do this so-called uh, avidity test. Okay, so antibody avidity test is, is quite simple. 
is the the detected antibody when you tr uh, uh, treat it with the urea. Urea is a denaturing agent. It weakens the the protein protein interaction. Um, so when you treat it with urea, the weakly bound antibodies will be removed, right? So so that measurement versus when you have no urea treatment, give you a ratio that's called the ability index. So essentially, it tells you the, the, the binding strength or binding degree between antibody antigen. It's been, a, it's been a gauge to antibody maturation. So basically, when somebody is uh, infected by a disease, it creates a lot of antibodies it's in a panic and try to target, target the, the virus, the, the antigen. But all the antibodies have different affinity or a binding strength to the to the virus. But over time, the body learns and, and gets trained, and it it goes through a, a B cell clonal selection process, so that the anti uh, antibodies become uh, better and better to to target the the, the, the virus. <laughs> so it's a measure of that maturation process. So as time goes by, the ability basically goes up. Okay, so that's why it's been used for a lot of uh, infectious disease uh, uh, scientists to study, you know, this uh, maturation process. So if it's a very low ability, it's a recent infection. If it's a high ability, means it's been a while, like more than half a year. Okay, so that antibody is binding to these uh, viruses uh, uh, strongly. And it's all also been used to, to assess uh, vaccination effectiveness. You know, right now there's a lot of work going on in vaccination de vaccine development. Uh, Avidity is actually a very good measurement of how good that vac vaccine is. Okay, so I think it will be useful for, for people in that field. And it also helps to, to decipher cross reactivity, okay, that I will tell you a little bit about. So here's some data about uh, antibody avidity we detected. So if you look at this data, this is a, a typical sample, right? So it's got antibody against S1 RBD. If you treat it with urea, the signals goes way down, okay? So this is a, giving you a low avidity as shown here, right? So the avidity is less than, you know, 0.3, for sure, okay. So, so this means that all these samples here we have are infected recently, which makes sense because you know in the U.S. the the infection really started seriously uh, since probably March, right? So that's good. You know we do have recent infections for all those people, but there's a very strange case, which is the 65 sample. Okay, you see it's got a VDT of 0.8, which means this had previous infection somehow. Okay, so that's very strange. And this one was also the one that does not have the antibody for. So if we look at this patient carefully with the help of uh, Sutter Health, this patient is 82 years old. Okay, you, you would think it's a, at this age it's vulnerable to, to 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 COVID, but here she actually showed an IgG against S1 on day six post the symptom. So in other words, the IgG pops up very early on, very quickly when the when the infection started, and even before IgM goes very high. Okay. So if you only do antibody measurement, that's all the information you're gonna get, right? So this is why I think uh, uh, avidity helps because this high avidity means this person actually had some previous infection, okay? Uh, that actually caused this very um, fast immune response. It, in, in, in biology, medicine is called anamnestic immune response. Basically, if the person had a related infection before, when something similar infects the person again, it has a memory effect. So the IgG would just shoot up 
even before the 14 day mark, right? Even before IgM, this is called an amnestic uh, uh, response. And so that previous infection caused this memory effect and give antibodies that cross react with COVID S1, but not to RBD. Okay, in other words, his, the, the person's previous infection is actually different from COVID, okay, because it does not recognize the COVID RBD. Uh, anyway, this person actually uh, did not be, be, uh, become ill at all, uh, recovered pretty quickly, um, and went home without coming back to the hospital. <laughs> okay, so she actually had a degree of immunity because of those pre previous uh, infection giving her this very fast immune response. So this is why I feel it's, it's a strong case that we want to study ability to understand uh, those uh, diseases. Now, most recently, this, this is new data, not in the paper, but we're adding into the re revision. We're beginning to study this uh, uh, for multiple uh, coronaviruses, okay, including SARS-2, SARS-1. Uh, SARS, by the way, ended in 2003, okay? And then also common codes. We, we can measure not only uh, antibody levels, but also ability, okay? So we have some interesting findings I'd like to share with you. So this data is based on pre-pandemic samples. So, so people who had never been infected by COVID or SARS, right? Because these are from US and SARS ended in 2003, a long time ago. Uh, so when you measure the antibodies in these, uh, these pre-pandemic samples, you see they had very low uh, antibody against uh, SARS-CoV-2, a little bit of higher uh, antibody against SARS, okay, even though they had not been infected, but they definitely all had common codes, okay, which makes sense. Almost all adults had common code. <clears throat> okay, that's fine. But now if you measure this uh, avidity, okay, it's uh, it's interesting, right? So so COVID case, the 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 bit is low as we discussed. It's recent infection, but then for the common codes, the ability are, are pretty high. That makes sense too because most of the codes happen maybe when when the person is around ten years old or something, or even younger than that. So so most people are exposed to to, to common codes uh, early on, you know the young people. That's fine. Now, if you look at the, the COVID-19 patients, it's uh, actually quite interesting and surprising to some extent. So this is the IgG level in the COVID-19 patients. And they have antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, okay, because they had COVID. But then you see they also had antibodies looks like cross-reacting to SARS. Okay, this is SARS-S1, SARS-RBD. I think this is not surprising either because it's uh, the, these uh, antigens are conserved pretty well between SARS to uh, COV-2. Cov uh, this is actually has been seen in literature already. It's published in a few papers. Uh, and then, of course, they had common codes before. Okay, so all of this kind of makes sense until you see the VDD data. <clears throat> uh, these, these people had low antibody VDD against uh, COV-2, right? We discussed about that. It's recent infection. They had high VDD against the common codes. We discussed about that. But then they had actually had pretty high ability towards uh, SARS, even though these people never had SARS. I don't think they have, right? I mean, the US 
I think the total number of SARS infection in the US is only 25 people or something. Okay, so, so this is what came as a surprise to me and, and at least to me, um, you know, it, it makes sense they, they cross to, to, to SARS in antibody, but they actually have high ability. Uh, so it looks like they had some some sort of uh, uh, memory. Okay, in other words, this cross reactivity is not uh, uh, due to the recent infection. It's actually due to some past uh, uh, process. Okay, so it's actually we think it's actually possible that the, this this common coronavirus infections can actually give some uh, memory effect to, to SARS. I mean, after all, SARS is an old infection. It's uh, 17 years ago, uh, and then it stopped circulating in, in the world. Um, but then I, so, so this after is an old uh, uh, infection. Uh, that's probably why there's some memory effect to this day. Uh, COVID is new, it's totally new, right? No one had it before. The VDT is very low. Um, so it's actually possible if, if in the future there's another coronavirus, I don't know, you know, there are some new viruses discovered in, in bats. So 20 years from now, if there's a new coronavirus, maybe there will be memory of COVID. Okay, so, so that's what I, uh, I, I learned or, 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 or thought about that at least uh, when I see this data. I think it's really an uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, observation. Okay, lastly, I just want to show you that, you know, this is an essay that's uh, sensitive. It's got pretty good analytical sensitivity. So, in saliva, the antibody concentration is uh, much lower than in serum. Okay, so you do need a very good um, uh, analytical sensitivity to detect antibodies and, and on the P-gold, we, we do have that, right? So, so here is a, a reference, is a serum sample that's diluted uh, a thousand times. So you can see these uh, spots lighting up. Now these four are saliva samples. And you see the spots. Okay, so you definitely have antibodies in the saliva that you can see visually very clearly. And these are the negative ones. You don't see anything. Okay, so this is why this is nearly zero, okay. So, so far we have uh, been almost 100% in detecting antibodies in, in recovered COVID patients. Okay, so this is a, a pretty non-invasive uh, platform. So let me just summarize the, the talk. Uh, this uh, this PGODES is quite uh, sensitive and specific. You can, you, you can do a saliva test, so essentially, Everybody can can do the test. I'm sure everyone is willing to do the test. Um, I th think uh, I think the fundamental aspects of this uh, test is uh, is actually quite interesting. You you can probably understand the disease more using all kinds of antigens and looking at cross reactivity, timing of the infection. Okay, so that's my talk, and thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dai and Dr. Tao. That was a very wonderful seminar. We appreciate it, and it's very uh, data heavy. We appreciate, uh, we appreciate you taking the time to present your exciting platform, your technology, and your results as well. Um, I want to remind the audience that if you type your questions in the chat box here, I'll do my best to get them answered by uh, Dr. Tang and Dr. Dag. So now I'll go ahead and jump right into the questions. I'll start with the questions um, by um, Buse. 
what is the approximate size of the nano gaps between the nano island? The gap is uh, is actually not that uniform. It, it, it ranges from, I would say, 10 to 30 nanometers. Uh, it's made by a chemistry process uh, in solution. Uh, it's, a, it's a spontaneous self-assembly process. Uh, but 10 nanometer, 20 nanometer is enough to, to give you the enhancement. Thank you, Dr. Dai. So how, the, uh, how are these nano islands are fabricated with which technology? Well, it's in the publications. It's essentially uh, uh, made by first making some gold nanoparticles on a, on a, on a glass slide. And then you use those particles as a seed uh, to, to grow the, uh, the size. Okay, uh, so it's like a seeding and then grow. You control the time, you can control the concentration to get to the structure uh, that give you the best uh, enhancement. It, so it's all in the previous publication. Gotcha. Um, do you have any data how the antibody test in saliva uh, correlates with qPCR test in saliva? No, um, we we collected saliva from people who had been confirmed to be COVID nineteen uh, patients and that they had done PCR tests, uh, I believe mostly using nasal swab techniques, uh, probably not uh, saliva-based PCR. Um, mm -hmm. So all these people, they had PCR results uh, based on nasal swab. Gotcha. So which method? We are trying. To, Sorry, go ahead. We are trying to. We are trying to detect antigens in saliva. There. Gotcha. That that would be very interesting to correlate with the PCR for the saliva and antigen in saliva. Yes, absolutely. Um, so which method is fast and effective in examining COVID nineteen, especially in a very large number of cases, such as Indonesia. Well, the PGO test is a pretty fast. I mean, it's a it's in a ELISA kind of plate, and uh, lately, uh, Namida's made a plate that can uh, measure uh, two hundred fifty samples uh, at each run. So it's, it's, uh, it's actually pretty high throughput. So if you have 200 samples, you can measure all of them at once. And you can get IgG and IgM levels at the same time. Mm -hmm. And you can get the same day, uh, uh, IgG, IgM against the multiple antigens if you want, okay? So, yeah. so it can be pretty high throughput. Yeah. Is this test effective intracellular or extracellular? For a virus that invades the cell, how do you investigate it with your scheme? Well, you probably have to do imaging, um, which would be unrelated to this talk. <laughs> um, but no matter as, uh, as well as my, my group, uh, uh, does a cellular uh, imaging or in vivo imaging that can track uh, particles, track cells um, using infrared uh, fluorescence. And uh, if uh, anyone is interested, you're welcome to, to contact me. Thank you. Uh, when you mentioned that the assay could supplement PCR, does this suggest that getting both tests is ideal for someone with symptoms, whether 
one tested positive or negative from PCR? I think if it's tested positive by PCR, it's probably very accurate, right? Uh, I, I, I don't think I heard much of false positive uh, by PCR. I, I think uh, it's mostly false negative. Um, so I would say if it's PCR positive and it's a good high quality PCR, uh, I don't know if it's necessary to do antibody, uh, but it's possible if you are negative by PCR, you actually miss the window um, of that test, and then antibody test would be would be useful. And, and this is why a high quality test uh, of antibody is important. Um, you know even after the window, you want to get it right, right? sensitive and, and specific. Right. Yeah, yeah, this is a Meiji tank. Can I add a few comments to this question? Sure, uh, please. Yes, we believe in, like many infection disease doctors, uh, you know, pra practitioners believe, antibody has been always important uh, to be the tool to aid to the diagnosis of uh, virus infections. Uh, in addition to what, uh, you know, the time window issue that PCR might miss, we do know for COVID-2, they are asymptomatic patients. And uh, how do you catch them? If antibody can be, you know, uh, inexpensive and uh, widely used, it actually can aid uh, detecting and catch people that may be missed by PCR. So yes, I think we believe that uh, high performance and easy to use antibody tests is uh, very important to supplement the PCR. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Tim. So this question is up with that question. Where do you buy your antigens? I've tried different providers, but bad results. Low sensitivity in general, specificity is no problem. <laughs> but I think that's why I'm attending your webinar, right? We, mm -hmm. We've bought any from, <laughs> from Signal Biological. Um, and uh, they, work, they work pretty well for, at least for the COVID-19 uh, antigens, S1 and S2, I mean, S1 and RBD, we, 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 we think it's very uh, specific. Um, when I see this data, you know, there's a cross reactivity to SARS, S1 and RBD. You know, I, I worry that, you know, how, how good are these antigens? Um, I don't know. It could be very good, but uh, if uh, this is why you, you need a very good, high quality biologics, right? So that whatever you, you observe is not due to the, the poor quality of the antigen. Um, so I will need to talk to cyanobiological about these antigens more <laughs> and make sure they're really uh, specific. But, but I think uh, for the SARS-2, the COVID-2 ones, it's very, very good. Thank you, Dr. Dai. So the next question, uh, which illumination source and wavelengths are you using for the analysis? For the uh, near IR, we use 800 nanometer. So you use a, the laser 785 laser for this one, 785 laser excitation. And for the red channel, it's a, what is it? It's a 6, uh, 680, 650 laser. Um, you know, the, the scanner is the well, uh, developed uh, uh, by Namidas and, and other companies as well. Uh, 
but you can you can basically have two lasers uh, to excite at the same time. Thank you. So there are still quite a number of uh, questions here, but due to the time, I think we have to wrap up right now. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Tan and Dr. Dai for your presentation. So um, if any of the uh, audience, if you have questions, um, feel free to reach out to us. We can address the questions to our speakers today. Uh, we'll do our best to get your, your questions answered. Uh, with that, We'll finish this series, uh, this webinar on COVID-19. Dr. Dai and Dr. Tao, uh, I want to sincerely thank you for the excellent webinar. We really appreciate it. It is a wonderful technology you have developed. We appreciate your time today, and I want to thank all of the attendees today. Remember, you get a link for this recording. And finally, I want to thank my colleague, Jin Lu, who coordinated and executed this series of the webinars as our marketing and sales manager today. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one. Bye.